there's a number of tracks that I found made the hairs on the back of your neck rise. It would spellbind you when you would hear the finished result. We played it late at night in the studio with the lights down and it was very tingly and exciting. Here's a group you can't define. A group whose music you can't pigeonhole, categorise or imitate. A group whose music actually seems to visually shine. In the middle of 15 years of beauty, mystery and innovation where the Cocteau Twins constantly skipped around and ahead of everyone else, they produced one album that perhaps glitters even more celestially than the others. It must be Heaven or Las Vegas. Robin Guthrie, Elizabeth Fraser and Will Heggie came together in 1981 in the industrial port of Grangemouth to form the Cocteau Twins, borrowing the name from an early unreleased song by Simple Minds. The following years saw Heggie replaced on bass by Simon Raymond, Robin and Liz marry and divorce, not to mention the creation of a sound that basically changed music. And it all started round at Robin's. The way that we got our record deal was quite unbelievable. We recorded some demos in my mum's living room with a little Grundig mono cassette recorder, and we wanted two copies, so we had to actually play the songs twice because we couldn't, like, copy the cassette. And we went to London on the overnight bus. It was, like, four quid or something from Falkirk. Took one to John Peel, took one to 4AD, which was the lucky label we'd selected because we thought we were so <laughs> great. We'd obviously get a record deal. And, of course, we just came home waited for the phone, which went, and we got a record deal. It took me years <laughs> to realise that this is not really the way that it works. Even so, it's hard to imagine the good offices of 4AD Records not being completely spellbound by what they were hearing. The Cocteaus were clearly in possession of something unique. In fact, they were experimental innovators by nature. The early sound, the first album, was essentially a live record. We just went in a studio in London and played our songs live. And the people in the studio were quite... Oh, very helpful, but very standoffish as well. And there was things I couldn't do, for instance... Uh, in the early days of Cocteau Twins, we had this little drum machine and we used to play it through, like, fuzz boxes and, like, guitar amps to make this really sort of sound that nobody actually ever heard until the Beastie Boys came along, you know, and the hip-hop guys when they started doing it. But the guys in the studio were going, oh, no, no, you can't do that, it's going into the red, you can't really, you know, look, it's distorting. And I'm like, yeah, and they're like, no. So we didn't really sort of fulfil the feeling of the sound that we had, and if you probably hear any live recordings or something from that time, it was just a monstrous sort of wall of noise and distortion. You could hardly hear Liz at all. Liz was completely the unsung sort of gem, you know, that was the thing that was still to sort of be discovered. When you get to Heaven or Las Vegas, I guess you're, what, like five or six albums down the, the line? Yeah, something but, like that, yeah. But, the, you know, the evolution between the first one and, say, Heaven or Las Vegas is enormous. You know, that's really us learning our craft and learning what to do and pushing things into different areas and trying different things. We're talking about the difference between 1982 is, like, some teenagers that had been to London once, you know, and by 1989 we'd played in about 25 countries and sold millions of records. The sound of Heaven in Las Vegas is probably a lot more purer. I think the technology had moved on a great deal. Journalist and Cocteau Twins fan, Pat Nevin. 
Robin was always a fanatical whiz kid with new machinery and every single gizmo that was available. Um, he liked to use everything he possibly could and had a fantastic ability to get heart and soul and beauty out of pieces of technology, which is not always the easiest thing. I think a lot of people use it and don't manage to develop any feeling from it, but Robin seemed to be able to do that with great ease. When you went into the recording of that album, what was the atmosphere like in the band? Because it has markedly progressed, isn't it, from the mm. work before? After the first couple of records, we established pretty much that I was the producer and you know, I wanted to record everything and have my own studio. What we did from record to record, we kind of used different studios or I started to build my own studios and we'd make our records there. Now, Heaven in Las Vegas was the first record that we made in a new studio that we'd built and I'd put in a bunch of new equipment I was really excited to use. We'd done Blue Bell Null, the album before, in a different studio and we just had this new environment that we were all really quite happy about. And I think the band was in good shape. You know, we hadn't been playing live. We hadn't played live for about four years. We stopped playing live in 86 and didn't play live again till 90. So we were sort of fairly concentrating on getting the studio thing together so that we could do an awful lot more. Now, it has to be said that we're still looking at the analogue technology there and there was nothing digital coming in or nothing that we could afford digital-wise or all the sort of stuff that one takes for granted now in the way that music is produced, you know, the putting music together on computers, that was still not happening. So, I mean, what we had to do was actually play everything and, like, use whichever techniques we could, you know. I mean, we were doing, like, tape loops and things like that instead of, like, computer loops and things. But, you know, we really had to sort of be very, very exacting in our performance. And with most of the Cocteau Twins, apart from the first record, the performance and the recording is a simultaneous thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. made up in the studio. We sort of built our songs more than wrote our songs. And it was the music first. The music was always finished pretty much as an instrumental before Liz would come along and get her inspiration and do her thing. Hi, my name is Brian Shank. I'm a big Cocteau Twins fan and occasionally contribute on to the CocteauTwins.org forum online. My favourite track from Heaven or Las Vegas is 5050 Clown. I think this is almost the personification of what the Cocteau Twins sound is actually all about. <laughs> such an emotional album. I think it's probably one of the most beautiful albums ever written. And Lizzie's vocals are just unbelievable. Only clips of what she's saying is decipherable, but it's not really what she's saying, it's how she's saying it, which makes it so amazing. There's always a very interesting dynamic in any band, you know, whether there's two, three or six or seven people in the band uh, and everyone's got their special place. I know there was a marriage within the Cocteau Twins with Les and Robin, but the three of them really had an incredibly close relationship. I think Simon's position in it quite often, particularly in the later times, was trying to draw those two fantastic abilities together, pull them together, which was done with fantastic success for a lot longer than they probably had any right to, considering the stresses and strains of a broken marriage and the relationships that they were going through. Liz never came to the studio until it was time for her to, you know, do stuff. She wasn't sort of hanging around a lot of the time. Myself and Simon used to go to the studio most days and, you know, I was in a sort of different place in my life at that point, so I would spend most nights at the studio as well, you know. Yeah, you can work that one out, can't you? Working hard, Robin. Working I'm, hard, I'm absolutely blood. working hard. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's called drug addiction. I just used to pour everything that I had left into 
that sort of you know lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I, was just, I would go there, I would work, I really would have a very sort of narrow vision of the world. I probably didn't read a newspaper for about three years, you know. I mean, I was just like really, really focused and. I had my playroom, which was my studio, so I poured myself into that. It was a very crazy time. Guardian journalist and friend Hamish McIntosh. I kind of think that album came out of the mania and the obsessiveness of a lot of what was going on lifestyle-wise. You know, it was quite a full-on thing. Robin went into his Brian Wilson phase with it. A Phil Spector chaser, shall we say. With three mercurial talents and the relentless, obsessive work schedule, it could have all gone so wrong for this album. But in that studio, they were creating something really amazing. The band's manager, Raymond Coffer, recalls his feelings on hearing the finished record for the first time. One was considered fortunate if they let me listen to a track every so often, and I never pushed that side of it. I was always happy to receive the music when they finished it. I was delighted when I got it, and uh, I thought that it was a very beautiful record, uh, an advance on what they had uh, produced before. Let's talk about the actual music on Heaven or Las Vegas for a while. It's incredibly accessible music on one level and there's an avant-garde sort of element to it as well. What are the characteristics for you of the songs on Heaven or Las Vegas? There's a strength in the songs that perhaps, you know, on some of the albums, well, what you just said, mixing the accessibility and the avant-garde-ness, you know, perhaps on some of the other records are a little bit more left field, some of the actual songs. You know, and I think balance-wise, it's sort of like, well, you can sing along with them and you can hum some of them to yourself. But again, there's an interesting sound and there's an interesting sort of like arrangement and structure to, to most of the pieces. titles were going to be until Elizabeth turned up with them and that they in themselves were uh, a joy and a treasure. The way that it worked with the song titles was, well, Liz wrote all the lyrics. She had reams and reams of paper with lyrics and things like that. And quite often we were just like randomly sort of see some of the words that she'd chosen, you know, she culled words from so many different sources and interesting usage of English and things from other languages and and quite often we're recording the vocals so I'm sitting looking at the piece of paper and she's singing it Uh, and it kind of doesn't sound like what the words are but it's it's a more interesting version sonically of the, the words that are written on paper and there may be one or two words or whatever and you know sometimes uh, me or Simon or Liz would actually pick out a couple of those words and go that would be a good title you know and obviously it's quite often that would just be the title for that song. There was one track that was on repeat at the time It was actually the last track, Fru Fru Foxes in Midsummer Fires, such a great title. In some cases, for instance, the title Cherry Coloured Funk, I think, is one of the lines in Fru Fru Foxes in Midsummer Fires. Mm -hmm. And it was just a phrase out of that song. My name's Joyce Gibson. I've been a fan of the Cockfield Twins since I was 18, which goes back to 1982. One of the things about the titles is although they seem apparently meaningless, they are kind of par for the course of the Cockfield Twins if you've been a fan for a long time. Songs like Pitch the Baby, Ice Blink Lock. And the one that always conjures up images for me is Cherry Coloured Funk. I just don't know why I see all these reds swirling around in my head.
You're listening to BBC Radio Scotland. This is Classic Scottish Albums with me, Davy Scott. There's little doubt that Elizabeth Fraser possesses one of the most unique voices in contemporary music, both as a singer and as a lyricist. And even though for years she famously obscured those lyrics, the combination of tone and fragmented words was always loaded with power and meaning. By the time we get to Heaven or Las Vegas, Liz is opening up the lyric book a wee bit to give us a peek. But it's still about the raw, emotional, almost physical experience of that sound. She had an extraordinary voice. And how Robin realised this, apparently met her in a pub or a club and just thought, she'll be able to sing. So it was quite incredible. Anyway, she she was quite incredible the way she sang, but what she sang was always a big question. The vocals, there was no writing on the early albums at all. There was certainly no lyrics. And definitely a lot of the noises that were made were not lyrics. Some of the times she used foreign phrases. Some of the times it was just a feeling. And some of the time there were some lyrics in there which to be honest, don't actually make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Quite a funny thing, if you ever want to laugh, is to go out on some of the websites and see how some people have written out these lyrics and see what she's trying to say, which are even more nonsense than it has to be said. You'll hang the hearts black and dull as the night. We hanged your pass and start being as you in ecstasy. Still being cried and laughed at before. Should I be sown in hugged? I can by not saying. Still being cried and laughed at from light to blue. And should I be hugged and tugged down through this tiger's mask? Robin very much knew what Liz, the sound she liked, the vocal sound, and also the layering techniques that Liz would use. Liz would just cycle on a bit of the song, get a bit that she was happy with, and then layer other parts on top and just work like that, going round and round in, in a loop and just effectively building up this kind of wall of our vocals, you know, and, and singing on singing on top or against what she'd already put. Something that Liz just did effortlessly in the studio, you know, it's like she would make up this thing and it would just sound, I'd be thinking to myself, you just made that up, you'll never be able to do that again. <laughs> and of course, she would do it again exactly and double track it perfectly on the first take, which, which sort of proves that it was somewhat more than improvisation to me anyway, you know. On Road, River and Rail, you hear her singing words like Ile de la Cité, that comes that at song's the start. A, so, that song's about and, Paris, yeah. Yeah, and, and you get the... Although we did the fishing version of that because we were convinced for a while that she was singing Rod, River and Reel. 
<laughs> right, so uh, I thought was called it the fishing song. The Road River and Rail is another example of just like the way Robin put his guitars together. You know, it's not many people that you can say they've got a sound or, or somebody I used to hear a lot of bands around that time getting described as sounding like the Cocteaus and, and I mean that's maybe a measure of, of the influence the Cocteaus had The sound and the power of the band was quite extraordinary. They didn't necessarily have a fantastic stage presence. In fact, they didn't have a stage presence really most of the time. It was mostly Liz beating her chest in time with the songs. But that didn't really make any real great difference to the people that are watching it. And uh, round about the time of having a Las Vegas, I went to see a concert. I was there with my wife. I invited my, one of my best friends, Brian McClure, who played for Manchester United, along with his wife to see the Cocteau Twins. We were sitting watching them in Manchester and the, the Cocktails were in fantastic form and the album sounded great live and it was brilliant. But four or five songs in, I, I wasn't actually enjoying it because standing behind me was Mr McClare with the most doer look in his face. Now, anyone who knows Brian McClare will know he looks like a doer get most of the time. So eventually I had to turn around to him and say, but Brian, are you, are you not enjoying it? He goes, I'm in heaven. <laughs> he didn't show it, but like a lot of other people around there, that was classical Brian McClare, but almost classical the type of people that used to go to see the Cocteau Twins. There wasn't a hell of a lot of jumping about there, but people were in their own space adoring what they were listening to. The space that Robin Guthrie, Liz Fraser, Simon Raymond and Will Heggie created is one that shines on to this day. After I interviewed Robin, I got a message to give him a call. There was something important he wanted to add for inclusion in this programme. During the making of the album, he and Liz had a child and this left a lasting impression on Heaven or Las Vegas. Liz was actually singing to their daughter, Lucy Bell. Back in 1984, when I made my first demo, I went to Palladium Studios in Edinburgh because I heard the cocktails recorded there and maybe I'd get some of their magic rubbed off on me. And I remember standing doing vocals, looking at their beautiful record sleeves pasted up on the wall. I'm just one of thousands of fans who stood watching while that band grew and grew until they burst into flames with a world of light and beauty that is heaven or Las Vegas. Making that record, right, one of the things that's a standout in my memory as a moment was it was a kind of little party we had just at the end of it when all the mixing had been done and it had been sequenced and there was a whole bunch of our mates over, you know, for the first time share the music with people, you know, and part of you is just like looking at how they're reacting, you know, and I have to tell you, you would know this, you know, what's the worst thing in the world? It's like you're playing somebody a new song and 20 seconds into it they start talking about oh, themselves yeah. usually, <laughs> eh? Well, this was like 40 <laughs> minutes of just silence and sort of mouths open. I mean, that for me was a very, very powerful moment, you know. It was like, whoa, it's a goodie. <laughs> 